Yo dog, Kenny Boucher here, Next Level Painting, hitting you up on the literal best of all days. Coming to you from the Beats Lab in Hollywood, California, we're doing it again. We're going to be revisiting glazing today. We've talked about it in the past several times. I think I've done uh, a better job in this video of maybe updating my lexicon of words. Look man, I'm not a word scientist, but I'm going to do my best today. Now let's date this video. We're at the beginning of ninth edition Warhammer 40k. Working on Death Guard, my first attempt at painting my own army in many years, which is crazy because I came from a commission painting background. I'm getting hype and passionate on this Death Guard project, and I suggest everybody who's going through similar things that I'm going through, let's date it again. They know GTs, all you got is time. So pick something you love, get hype on that ninth edition flavor and put all that passion down in those models. Let's do this thing, guys. I got that putrefier death guard style right here. That's the grenade guy. Look at all these grenades. I spent a billion seconds on those, but today I'm gonna show you how to do the big one with the liquid in it, chilling in his right hand with that fire orange theme that I've been using on all my characters during this ninth edition project. Look, guys, it's all about that wet palette. Got the everlasting wet palette, Red Grass Games right here. I'm gonna lay out a new piece of parchment. This thing has seen some battle. I'm gonna lay out my colors. Now I'm using Manya Bahabi's Pro Krill right here. You can use any red, orange, and yellow that you like. I'm gonna just organize them kind of left to right, dark to bright, you know, not gonna overthink it, I'm not a scientist here. I'm gonna use a little bright ivory, kind of for my highlight. I think it helps with desaturation, which is a fancy art term for kind of like dulling up your colors. Now I'm gonna lay out a bead of flow improver and a bead of water. Okay, and I'm gonna kind of preset my colors. Left to right, pure red, little red with some orange. Then a little dirty paint water from the paintbrush that has the red, the orange in it, and throw a little yellow in it. Kind of just get our jumping off points ready to go so we can in real time make the adjustments. We're gonna be painting thin, guys, which means I'm gonna be using a little bit of water, maybe a little flow improver. Gonna keep it kind of thin. And when it's kind of thin and wet like this, you wanna just make sure it's nice and smooth and even. You wanna utilize light brush pressure, the tip of your paintbrush, get max coverage, kind of manipulate any excess moisture into a smooth, compliant finish let it dry fully you see we got some red it's very thin it's being informed by the brown underneath it no big deal i'm not trying to get maximum opacity at this moment now when you're working with these like really bright hues like this we can combine them all day every day right maybe flame up the red maybe yellow up the orange whatever but at the end of the day the brightness and the darkness that's going to come from our opacity that's the only real control I have here. And I'm using very light opacity and I'm building up slowly. With each layer, what I'm doing is blocking light from penetrating and revealing the underneath layers. It's like imagine a sheet of glass and there's a little bit of orange in that glass. You lay it in front of you and you can see right through it, but maybe it's a little orange. Well, if you put a thousand of those glasses in front of you, you wouldn't be able to see shit, just be orange. So that's kind of the, the idea here behind this type of glazing, okay? Now, progressively, as we introduce more yellow and orange to the mix, I'm gonna start to create a transition. Now, this is not gonna be as silky smooth as the airbrush or as fast. This is kind of a patient man's game, okay? It's very fun, it's rewarding when you start getting into the glaze game. It's one of the most versatile paintbrush techniques on planet Earth. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a brighter light source from the bottom of this vial moving up to orange kind of emulating fire where maybe like the yellow is where it's burning and the red is furthest away from it and as we move down we're making small adjustments you see we're adding a little bit more yellow to our orange and red maybe start pulling some ivory in because look it's going to start getting desaturated that's just the nature of it right when i start introducing some of that ivory it's not going to be as vibrant that, that that beautiful flame hue is going to get a little dull that's okay all you care about right now is making sure the bright shit's bright and the dark shit's dark. Make sure your contrast is there. Make sure your values are progressing. Two things I don't care about right now is how 
blurred my transitions are, how fuzz they are into each other, and how saturated my actual highlights or values are. Those don't matter to me because I, got, I have the power, right? I got the power of Grayskull right here in my hands. I can go back, forth, infinitely. I can go up, down, left, right, meaning I can go darker, brighter. I can go a different hue, back to another hue. When you're painting this thin, you can kind of do it a thousand times. It doesn't matter, okay? You've got plenty of time, got all the fucking freedom in the world. Now, to summarize exactly what I'm doing here, is I'm using water to lower the opacity of a pigment or a paint. Then I'm taking some of that excess of moisture off my brush, maybe through use it, utiliza utilization of a paper towel, maybe my construction paper, maybe my left hand, my thumb, whatever I'm doing, okay? When you lower the opacity like this, when you start cutting it with water, you now have that sheet of glass I was talking about, okay? Now the water, it's hard to control. It's kind of dead to me. So now that the water has done its job, I don't need all that water loaded up in my sable hair brush, right? I do strongly recommend a nice fat sable brush. They're very absorbent. They retain a lot of moisture. They'll help you transfer the glaze to the model. But by getting some of that excess of water out of there, I get to stay in control. I get to aim. It doesn't want to just disperse, okay? It doesn't want to have all those tide lines. So I'm using the tip of my brush, maybe a little stippling motion, just, hey, stay right here. I want you to be brighter right here. You know, the brightness is coming from that yellow, maybe that ivory, okay? You see, I don't give a shit if it's blurring into the orange, blurring into the red, that doesn't matter to me, okay? I'm slowing it down, being a little bit more deliberate. Now, the other thing you wanna always consider is your dry times. That's why I just use pure water. Sometimes I use Flow Improver when I want it to stay wetter longer, but when I'm doing these like quick sheets of glass, I want it to dry pretty pretty quick. The uh, issue is if you're not patient, you don't let it dry between steps, you can end up reactivating it, peeling it up. It's a bit of a nightmare, so just be patient. Typically, you have enough time to lay it down, move to the left, move to the right, do a couple other sections, and it's fully dry. So as long as you're staying in motion, you're staying busy in the Beats Lab, you're gonna be fine. Now, as you start getting your values opaque, right? When you start chasing that opacity and our yellows are finally becoming yellow, our oranges are starting to look orange, you're gonna start to realize something interesting here, especially with fire, that red looks different when red is on top of orange than when orange is on top of red. Now, this is with our sheets of glass. When the orange is informing the red, it's a different, it's a different feeling. When the yellow is being informed by the orange, it's a different feeling, okay? So I'm layering it out. I don't care about that right now. But once I have the values looking correct and they're mostly in the, in the correct hue range, the correct pigment range, then that's when I'm gonna start making decisions like, hey, I want some pure yellow to dial this back up. I wanna creep this into the orange midtone, right? I wanna get into that real estate of orange, which is most of the fire, right? That flamey effect. But then once I kinda like creep in there, Maybe I'm gonna grab some of that orange and fight back into it, right? And you get a different effect, more of that heat. So you start to notice things when you start glazing, when you start lowering the opacity of your paint, removing the excess moisture, you're gonna to start to see interesting things happen. Like I'm gonna start introducing some of this ivory blend, right? And we're gonna really start crushing that value up a notch. We're gonna be going to that super bright world, but innately it's not very yellow, right? It's a little desaturated. That's okay. I'm making it correct right now. Now, we are a DJ and we are spinning this wax in real time. So remember earlier when I said you always gotta let that glaze dry? Well, that's not, I lied to you guys, that's not true. If I use a little flow improver, which slows the dry time down a little bit, I can lay some of that glaze down and instantly go back to my palette, grab the mid-tone and I can just kind of dial it in there. And that's kind of where glazing and wet blending are on the same coin of blending. Okay, wet blending is uh, semi-opaque and kind of wet, right? Whereas glazing is like super transparent and not that wet. You can blend those two techniques together at any point. I'm keeping a kind of a bead of moisture here and I'm quickly dialing in the other colors, letting the capillary effect drag them together, but I'm working with a transparent set of pigments here. You know, you start to see the tide lines slowly vanish as I'm moving back and forth, right? You're seeing like those really rough transitions start to fuzz into themselves as I start to aim 
at the borders like where the yellow meets the orange i might aim at that where the ivory meets the yellow i start to aim at that right and a lot of times when you lay it down initially it's very vibrant and that's because when things are wet they look really bright and then when it dries off you see hey that shit was like barely anything at all it's dirty paint water right so I just stay patient, I stay committed, and I find this to be one of the most therapeutic, most fun styles of painting. I can get lost in this technique. The infinite freedom of moving back and forth and playing with the feathering, the blurring. You can go hard here. Now, I'm going to start introducing some of that orange into that midtone again. I'm going to start really feathering it out. It's still wet. I still have a bead. I'm going to just start dispersing it, creeping into the red, pulling up, right? I like to use the tip of my brush a lot and use a stippling motion when I'm starting to dial in these borders when they meet versus kind of, you know, just painting the whole thing like with windshield wiper motions, a traditional brush stroke. A lot of this starts looking like pointillism, right? When I start dialing it in and you just make small incremental steps in the direction you're trying to go as you start dialing it in because now I am trying to get that fuzz. Now I am trying to get that flawlessness now that I've got everything laid out. Now, if you look at this guy's armor, that was a cheat code. We actually airbrushed this guy real quick and then we used a bunch of glaze technique to just introduce drama into his chest panel, to his arms, really fast because it was already there. Sometimes all you gotta do is lay it down with the airbrush real quick and then you could just glaze up 10 minutes, you got some drama. Now on something like this liquid vial, we've got two challenges here. First off, it was brown, so we had to start from scratch. Second off, orange, yellow, red, Maintaining saturation and that flame effect is not the easiest thing in the world, right? I do several videos and live classes on that flame effect. It's tricky. And the third thing is it's a, a sphere. Spherical shapes. I struggle with them. Okay. So now we're starting to dial in the final highlights toward the bottom, try to get that maximum opacity, try to bring it up a notch. Every time I throw some of that ivory in, it desaturates a little bit and I'm always, you know, leaning toward reglazing yellow in but there's a point where you just have to let it ride just have to let it have it has to be popping that's where that contrast comes from that's where it starts to generate that fire now look i'm gonna grab the transparent black this is the moment we're gonna make it look like there's liquid inside the vial here in a minute but first i want to go a little darker now that i've got all this stuff dried up to make things look a little reflective sometimes you got to go a little harder so black and red mixed together we made it a glaze kind of a wet loose glaze and we're going to just start bringing some more shadow in from the top it looks horrible don't worry we're moving quick we used a little flow improver we're going to throw some orange back in it's still wet we're using the stippling motion and we're just going to start dragging that glaze back down into the rest of the model and that opacity is going to help blend everything together it's going to give us a little bit more strength coming from the top help us with that reflective quality i reset i'm gonna throw some more of that yellow in creep it up from the bottom and that's kind of all you need to do there might be a little bit of a tide line there there might not be a fully flawless transition but once we cut in the frame and we get this horizontal black line that i'm painting in right now it represents the horizon guys okay he's tilting forward with the bottle and I'm painting kind of like a nice horizontal slash straight across, pure black, giving it a slight curvature to respect the spherical nature of this object. And that represents the empty part of the flask. That's where there is no liquid, okay? That's just black. And that's the effect, right? We're using a combination of heart pull edge highlight techniques. We're just using the tip of our small edge highlight brush using transparent black from Monument Hobbies. And we're just trying to carve this black line in perfectly, right? Horizontal, giving it a slight curve. That's the emptiness, okay? It works really well. It gives you the effect. Your eye starts to see what we're doing here. As he's tipping it and you're seeing some of that liquid pour out, we're going to make sure to carry that horizontal line up to that flask mouth. Now we let it dry for a second. We're going to come back in and we're going to dial in some righteous edge highlights. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to oppose that horizontal black line with a tight little line of bright ivory. We're going to just hit it, pow, hit it, pow, because that's where like the liquid is floating and possibly catching a little bit of light. Okay. We're honoring it, we're representing, you see? Now we're gonna just start faking it. We're gonna just start curving in some lines. We're gonna accentuate where our light source is with a nice curved line. We're gonna actually 
bring it down from the black down on the right side there you definitely want to have some of that line in the black that reflective quality really starts to pop when you let it hit the black section now your brain is starting to see it is truly a shiny piece of glass right we're going to take some creative liberties here carve it a couple of excessive lines toward the bottoms of some of these areas where the light source is because we're also kind of juggling the fact that this is like a flamey hot magical container of liquid let that shit dry we're going to load back up with some yellow we're going to transform the yellow back to a glaze we're going to use it as a sheet of glass we're going to just inform some of those ivory lines back to a more uh saturated version of the yellow just let it pop okay we're going to make sure our lines are looking strong take our time let it dry reintroduce some of that ivory let it pop Try to get that reflective quality. We're gonna actually start edge highlighting some parts of the vial there, the flask lip that's empty. Now what we're gonna do is gonna take that transparent black back into the emptiness of the flask and we are gonna use it to re-up the opacity of the black but also use it to edit the line shape and thickness of our opposing lines that we let creep into the black. So that's gonna let me kind of clean it up, sharpen it, maybe get it help with the tapering, okay? easy peasy lemon squeezy now i'm feeling good about that uh one of the things that's holding this thing back is you want a nice little black border you want a nice shadow border between the frame of the glass and the glass so this is gonna i'm letting the black kind of touch the yellow and the orange and the red between the frame and any you know highlights any relevant highlights this is gonna really snap it Okay, I'm gonna just paint that frame real quick. We're gonna throw our brass bronze mix from our Death Guard 101 tutorial on this flask. And as you can see, after a little bit of a back and forth, working our glaze magic, we have a beautiful piece. That vial is what you look at when you see this model. It brings the orange to the model, which is our theme for our characters. Guys, thanks for watching this video. And as always, play on, players. If you're looking for a little bit of that one-on-one -on -one training and some coaching, I got your back. Over on Patreon, we do have a private coaching tier and we do offer the brand new 101 curriculum and now 102 wet blending.